In a few days, a consequential election will take place, as citizens of the United States will go to the polls and elect a president. In fact, they already started voting. You probably know a few forecasting models that try to predict what will happen on election day, who will get elected, by how much, and with which coalition of states. But how do these statistical models work? How do you account for the different sources of uncertainty, be it polling errors, unexpected turnout, or media events? How do you model co-variation between states? How do you even communicate the model's results and afterwards assess its performance? To talk about all this, I had the pleasure to talk to Andrew Gelman and Merlin Heidemans. Andrew was already on episode 20 to talk about his recent book with Jennifer Hill and Aki Vetari, Regression and Other Stories. He's a professor of statistics and political science at Columbia University and works on a lot of topics, including why campaign polls are so variable, why elections are so predictable, the statistical challenges of estimating small effects and methods for surveys and experimental design. Merlin is a PhD student in political science at Columbia University, and he specializes in political methodology. Prior to his PhD, he did a bachelor's in political science at the Freie Universität Berlin. I hope you will enjoy this episode where we dove into the Bayesian model they helped develop for The Economist, and talked more generally about how to forecast elections with statistical methods, and even about the incentives the forecasting industry has as a whole. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 27, recorded October 23rd, 2020. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the project, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.anvil.app. That's learn based stats the anvil the app. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive patient swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash stats. Starting at $3, you can get various benefits like the private learn based stats Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm very grateful for any support. Let me show you how to be a good breezy and change your predictions after taking information in. and if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing let's adjust those expectations what's a Bayesian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice a Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability cause every belief is provisional and when I kick a flow mostly I'm watching eyes widen maybe cause my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Friedman. Hey folks, you probably noticed that this special episode comes only one week after episode 26, which is not the usual frequency of the podcast. This is a lot of work, but it was made possible by my wonderful Patreon supporters. Thank you again, dear Bayesians. This is thanks to your support that I can bring you exactly this kind of special content. In particular, I want to thank those who just joined the crew in the full poster tier or higher. I'm talking about the amazing Jack Wells, Matthew Maldonado, Ian Cosley, and Ali Salim. I'm sending you all my gratitude from Paris. And now, let's talk election forecasting with Andrew and Merlin. Andrew Gelman, Merlin Heidemans, welcome to Learning Asian Statistics. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. I assure you, I didn't create this podcast to do an episode about electoral forecasting. But yet, I have to say I'm super happy because this is one of the topics I'm passionate about. So be advised, this episode is going to last three hours. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, but that would be so fun. I wanted to invite you here because you both worked with Elliot Morris at The Economist to develop a forecasting model of the US presidential election. But first, 
I like to have some background about the guests. So Merlin, can you talk about your background? Because you started with political science and you are now doing a PhD, I think, in internal national relation and political methodology. So what's your story, basically? I did my BA in Berlin at the Freie Universität. And mm -hmm. there I started actually at Humboldt, did a year there, then transferred, and then did the last year in Copenhagen for an exchange year. Oh, okay. And from there applied in the US and then moved directly from Copenhagen to here. Okay. Yeah, I started in international relations and over time became less and less interested in those kinds of topics, mm -hmm. partially because of the research that was being done and partially because I find methodology more interesting because the range of topics that it can be applied to is larger and less mm -hmm. constrained. And then I end up in Andrew's orbit and that's how we partially got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. I did not know you had an orbit, Andrew. How strong is your gravitational force, you would say? It's said that you gain a pound a year. <laughs> And that's actually pretty accurate for me. Like, not uniformly, but I guess during my adult life, maybe I've gained about a pound a year. So my orbit, you know, like I'm more of an attractor than I used to be. Merlin was my teaching assistant a couple times for my applied statistics class in political science. Ah, okay. I see. I'm guessing that that's when you were formally introduced to Bayesian methods, right, Merlin? Or was it even before? Actually, I knew that Andrew would be at Columbia and I bought BDA in my third year of undergrad in Copenhagen mm. and had the intention to go through the book there because I didn't really have to take courses still. Mm -hmm. That never happened, sadly. <laughs> I know, like, I like Bayesian methods just for the transparency of the approach compared to the reliance on theorems and assumptions mm -hmm. and the possibility of just checking everything from the ground up. Yeah feels much more satisfying and honest to me in some way mm -hmm. than like a frequent test approach to it. Yeah, that's interesting. That's funny to me because I had like kind of the same path as you, because I started in international relations to uh, did that at the Freie Universität and then became more and more interested in statistical methodology. And because I was studying electoral forecasting, came into Bayesian stats exactly for the same reasons, as you said. Also, because I guess it's a field where you have sparser data at least in France and Europe, where I do that, you have less data. And so the priors and the assumptions are more important. And also the uncertainty estimation is super, super important. It also forces you to think about the choices that you're making rather than, yeah. I know if, if I look at international relations research, even like the last couple of years, it's always like, let's take this data, let's plug this model in and then take the coefficients from there and yeah. our uncertainty estimates mm -hmm. and then call it a day. Mm -hmm rather than making it, I know, very open choices about why you're doing X and not Y. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Super interesting. And Andrew, by the way, I, I realized I didn't ask you the last time you were on the show with Jennifer Hale and Aki Vettere. I didn't get to ask you because you come from a mathematics and statistics background, but how come you decided to focus on Bayesian statistics in the end? Well, I did mathematical Olympiad training in high school, and I found out that there were people who were better at that than I was. And <laughs> I think I didn't really have a good sense of mathematics at the time. So it could seem like we didn't really know about applied math. So you got the idea that at any given time in history, there's some people like Koshi who figure everything out. And then there's some other people. And mm. it's not really clear what they do, except like get things wrong and until Koshi comes around. And I didn't want to be those people. So in college, I majored in physics because I just didn't want to be a mathematician. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I understand physics very well. And I could get good grades, but that was cheating because I could do the math, right? Mm -hmm. And so it would be as if you took a foreign literature class and you already could speak a bunch of foreign languages. You could still get most of the way just at the technical level, and then you can figure out the rest. So I decided not to do that. And I had taken probability classes because they were offered at a time that didn't conflict with my other classes. And then I ended up taking a statistics class, an applied class, and I thought it was very easy. So I talked to the teacher and I said, this is interesting, but it's really too easy. I'm not sure what to do. And he said, no, statistics can be very hard. It's just easy for you, but there's harder stuff. So he convinced me to study statistics and he did Bayesian work. 
But when I first heard that he did Bayesian stuff, that wasn't what I'd been taught before. So in his class, it was an applied class. So I did everything using non-Bayesian methods. I like figured out a hypothesis test to invert and all these things. Mm -hmm. But then when I was in graduate school, I was working on some applied problems and I just couldn't resist using a Bayesian approach because it was for modeling elections. And we had a certain thing we wanted to estimate. And I realized that the only way to frame it would be that you have one unknown parameter for each data point. Mm -hmm. So I needed to have a probability model. So I ended up using Bayesian methods and they were very useful to me. Mm. I often say that statisticians don't live up to their own principles. So when we tell people you're supposed to make decisions based on random sample surveys and designed experiments and correcting for bias and pretest and post-test measurements, all the good things that we have in regression and other stories. But then when we decide things like how to teach our classes, we just do stuff. We don't evaluate anything, no experimentation, no sampling, no, no formal evaluation. And similarly, I'm saying, I didn't say I use Bayesian methods because I did Bayesian inference and I felt that was optimal mm. or that my posterior distribution was this. I just said, well, it worked in some examples and mm. the person who taught it to me was very persuasive. Mm. So I'm not actually using statistical principles when making my own decisions. <laughs> That's okay. If you want, I can edit that last part out in the episode. <laughs> What? That's important. Don't you think people should hear that? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. This is actually really great. But I love these stories because like in your story, there is one part serendipity, you know, like getting to in a statistics class because it doesn't have conflicts with your other classes. But there is also the practical side of the things. And this is something you often talk about, actually, like you ended up using that because it was working and it was a satisfying framework that was answering the questions you were asking. So you kept using it. And I think that's something a lot of people are wanting to do. Yeah, I do kind of wonder what would have happened. Well, I was considering going to graduate school in physics. I think my life would be less interesting. But if I had gone to graduate school in statistics somewhere else where they didn't do Bayesian methods, I think I would have done something different. So mm. I, it does make me wonder like where I would be now, what I would be doing. Yeah, definitely. It would be fun to explore these different versions of the world, like an MCMC sampler, you know, that we could do with, with the world. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think we still can't, but maybe one day to get to the heart of what we're going to focus on today, because I could talk about that for hours. But how did you guys end up working on this electoral forecasting model with The Economist? So I've worked on electoral forecasting for a long time since the 80s, actually, the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, in that case, we built a model to forecast the 1992 presidential election of the first election of Bill Clinton. We did not use polls for that. Mm -hmm. It was forecast based on fundamental variables. The reason why I did the forecast was not because I wanted to forecast the election, but because I was writing a political science paper with a colleague on why the polls are so variable when elections are so easy to forecast. Mm. So we thought if we're going to say elections are easy to forecast, we should actually do it. And the existing forecasts were at the national level or at the state level, but there were no forecasts that combined national and state forecasts. Mm. So we did that using a hierarchical model. So you're forecasting all 50 states at once, but there's a dependent structure. Then from that, we did some fun things like we figured out the probability that your vote would be decisive in any state. We figured out the probability the election would be an exact tie, all sorts of cool things. Mostly didn't write it up. People most didn't seem to care about it. Hmm. It was a different news media environment. Hmm. So I didn't have contacts at the newspaper or the news, but no one seemed to want to know this kind of thing. And then in the 2000s, the poll aggregation became more popular and I did some research on it. But then a few months ago, Elliot from The Economist called us up and wanting to do a forecast and could you help me out? So that was how it worked. Mm. Okay, I see where it's going from. And actually, Merlin, how old were you in 1992? <laughs> uh, minus two, I think. Depends on the <laughs> when in the year. 
Yeah, that's what I had in mind. <laughs> so you don't remember this election very well, do you? I don't remember Clinton's first election. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, by the way, Andrew, like this paper, because in the end you were using this fundamentals model without the polls. So what do you think about that today when you talk about that? Because in the end now, in the economist model, you guys are using the polls. So what would you say here? There's a fundamentals model which they put together, and that serves as a prior, and then you combine the information from the polls. The fundamentals model is still pretty good. It, it has some uncertainty. It predicted that Jill Biden would win the election, but with some uncertainty, because it's not a year where just the fundamentals would give you a very, very strong prediction. Yeah. The polls definitely add information. It's kind of funny, like the point, I was doing it really for the purpose of political science. So mm -hmm. when we did it back in 1992, we wanted to demonstrate that you could predict the election outcome by state without using information occurring during the campaign. That was kind of the point. Yeah. The goal was not to predict, even though we could. And then my colleague and I had a discussion afterwards. So we were a little disappointed that we didn't get more publicity, like we're getting computing all these great probabilities. I used it for a lot of political science research. We kind mm. of overturned literature on voting power and, and other things. Mm. But we talked about, should we go into the forecasting business? Not literally the forecasting business, but should we like publicly do forecasts? Yeah. And we decided not to because if you forecast, you only have to get it wrong once and you look really bad. Yeah. So we just thought this is not where we want to be. Now, it's a little different now because there are so many forecasters. So hmm. if we get it wrong, then other people get it wrong, too. And we can talk later if you want about incentives in forecasting. Oh, yeah. So it's complicated. But I guess there's also a layer of distance because the economist is doing the forecast. We're not doing it. We're just helping them out. So we're not taking responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're definitely going to talk about incentives because you wrote a paper recently about that. But first, maybe Merlin, can you give us just a conceptual overview of the model that you guys did for The Economist so that we can dive into it afterwards? You know, just a high level overview as like Andrew, for instance, said that for the 1992 election, it was like a hierarchical model. So how does it work here? Well, we are using the polls to estimate state trends. We have a multivariate correlate random walk for the individual state trends. So we essentially assume that similar states will move in similar ways for time periods for which we don't have new data for those particular states. Mm -hmm. So I know what are two states that are next to each other. I know I, I'd assume Louisiana and Alabama are two states, I think. Yeah. <laughs> they also move together. Like if we have polls in Alabama, but not for Louisiana, they also move together in our forecast mm. just because we assume that they're similar. Yeah, yeah. Louisiana and Alabama aren't next to each other, but they're close to each other. <laughs> mm. Like close to each other. Yeah. I frequently Google state abbreviations to be sure yeah. that I'm actually thinking about the right state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same for me. I mean, for non-Americans, it's always hard to see the abbreviations here. <laughs> no, but like as Andrew like said earlier, we have our fundamental space forecast for election day, mm. where this serves as prior information for the random walk. Okay. That then goes backwards from election day to the first day of the campaign season, mm -hmm. or when the model starts, and thereby we essentially partially pool between the uncertainty in the poll space forecast and the uncertainty in our fundamental space forecast, mm -hmm. where the uncertainty like where over time as it comes closer to election day the polls essentially gain more weight as the distance between the latest polling day to election day decreases. So Merlin said the polls essentially gain more weight. So I want to emphasize the word essentially, that it's not that we construct a model and we weight the polls. No. We don't take a weighted average of the polls. Mm -hmm. We estimate latent parameters and the polls are data. That said, you can roughly approximate the estimate as a kind of weighted average. It's possible to do that. You can differentiate the estimate with respect to the data and then the derivative of the inference with respect to any given poll data represents the implicit weight of the poll. So you can kind of back that out. But it's not that we're like sitting in the lab coming up with good weights. It's more like we're coming up with the model and then the model figures out the weights. Mm -hmm. In some way, the variance of the poll-based forecast on election day decreases as we come closer to election day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't go to zero. No. 
<laughs> it doesn't go to zero because first, you only have a finite number of poles. Second, mm. we have an error term in our model that says all the poles could be off by a certain amount. Mm. Yeah, like a systematic error from the poles. An unknown systematic error, exactly. Okay. That being like the, the central part of the model, and then we have a bunch of adjustment terms for like polling houses for the way that horses, where they call people, or where they do an online poll, and those kinds of things. Yeah, okay, so let me summarize all of it because there are a lot of moving parts there. So for listeners to follow, let me try to summarize. So if I understood correctly, there are two main components to the model. You have the socioeconomic fundamentals that act as priors for the multivariate Gaussian random walks, you said. And then the poles help updating those priors. So is this correct? And does this mean that the poles then are used as the likelihood? Because Andrew said they were used as the data, so I'm guessing you used that as the likelihood? Well, yeah, sure, you could say that. I mean, there's a model for the poles given the latent variable. So any given state poll is taken to be an estimate of public opinion support for the two candidates in that state on the day that the poll was taken. Mm -hmm. And it's an estimate with a bias and a variance. Yeah. The bias itself depends on latent parameters for the survey polling house and other bias factors. And then what it's estimating is opinion on that day. So we have a latent model for how the opinion changes. A national poll is said to be an estimate of the national opinion on that day, which is a average, a weighted average of the 50 stated opinions weighted by their predicted turnout. Actually, it is still the last election's turnout. Okay, well, it's weighted by a crude estimate of predicted turnout. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so the way that national polls and state polls are put in together is through, the, we don't have a latent time series for national opinion, we have latent time series for state opinions. From that, the national opinion is considered to be a deterministic function. Yeah. And we don't actually model the raw data from the polls. That would be kind of the next frontier of this modeling. We use the published summaries from each survey. The interesting point, though, to note is that we started out with modeling the national trend and then modeling state level deviations from that, yeah. but change that at some point over the summer. Mm -hmm. And why? I mean, there's more information. It's kind of the right way of doing it is to model the states and then have the national be derived from that. Mm -hmm. That seems to make sense to me too, but it's true that at the same time, you know, maybe I would have started with the national trend too, and then take an offset from that. So that's interesting to hear about that. And I'm always curious about, you know, the intellectual path that people take to build iterative versions of their model. And something I like actually in the visualizations that are on the website is that the graphs show the temporal uncertainty in the model due to the time remaining until election day. You hinted a bit about that, but can you talk more specifically about how does the model do that concretely? The uncertainty until election day? Yeah, how do you account for this temporal uncertainty until election day? Yeah. We add our prior belief about how much national opinion changes from day to day mm -hmm. is a certain value. From day to day, we increase essentially the variance of the forecast by a certain number if there is no new data. And then given that it moves towards the fundamental space forecast, I guess it shrinks back to that forecast or that prior. But yeah, like how the forecast develops over time is largely, I think, a function of what we believe ex ante about public opinion and how it changes over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So like in the absence of new polls, of new data, then the model will revert to the prior belief that you have ex ante before the election. Yeah. And I mean, the further in the future, the days for which you want to forecast, the more uncertain you will be about it. The question is then just is like how uncertain, like how much more uncertain we're going to be about. Yeah, exactly. Because your model shouldn't be as uncertain, like right now, as it was at the beginning of September, for instance. Yeah. 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 But that makes it, and that looks a bit like what Gaussian processes do in the end, like in the absence of data, then they revert to the inferred mean of the Gaussian process. So here, I guess it's a bit of the same behavior that you're having, whereas the difference is that you are modeling the temporal component with a multivariate Gaussian random work, right? Yeah. Mm hmm Okay, this is super interesting. And actually, I want to focus a bit on how you estimate the uncertainty in the model. And to do that, you use elastic net regularization and leave one out cross validation. So unfortunately, I don't think this is available on the GitHub, but I'm still curious about that. Can you maybe explain to listeners what these techniques are like more generally? 
Oh, we didn't do that part. The economist people did that. So we kind of talked to them a little bit, but I don't think we're the right people to tell you. And you can predict the election. There's a lot of evidence that we call political and economic fundamentals. So economic fundamentals, like the change in the economy, the last year of the president's term. And political fundamentals are things like whether incumbent is running for re-election and the popularity of the incumbent. So the idea is that first, like a more popular incumbent is better for the incumbent. Obviously, it's also better to have a strong economy. Those predictors should be more important in years when incumbent is running for re-election than when it's someone else from his party. But then also all of these predictors should be less important now than they used to be because of political polarization. There are fewer undecided voters. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of all in there. I mean, it's not that the model was a secret from us, but we weren't really participating in that part of the modeling except to maybe occasionally give advice. The other part of the model that's important is previous election results in the states because the relative positions of the states don't change much from one election to the next. But maybe Merlin has more to say. Like We were somewhat distant from that aspect of the model. We were talking a bit about how we would have done it in the case if we had done it. That's interesting. And we would similarly have considered creating a forecast for how the fundamentals would develop over time until election day. Mm -hmm. And then given the uncertainties in the predictors, make a prediction based upon that un the uncertainty in those predictors, the uncertainty in the parameters based on past elections mm -hmm. for how, like you're given a particular state of the economy, given a particular level of approval and whether it's incumbent or not, how that in the past would have predicted the election outcome on election day given particular predictive values and would have based on that made a forecast for the election outcome in any of the 51 different states. Yeah. Because that would have probably been more accurate in describing our uncertainty and would have also been part of the model rather than in this case, taking estimates from the outside and plugging them in on each individual day. Mm -hmm. I could be incorrect here, but the model right now is not generative, given that we run the model each day on different data, with the new data being the new input that we get from the fundamentals. Yeah, I see. But so here, basically, the method you outline looks basically like uh, leave one a chorus validation, right? I mean, yeah, that's the method they used for getting the estimates from past elections. Yeah. I would just say there's no way they could have done this forecast like this to get the fundamentals based forecast in a kind of hands off way. So they're using machine learning tools as a form of getting a stable kind of regression. But I think often machine learning is associated with you put the data on the computer and it figures it all out. That's not the case here. You have to really hold its hand. You have to check that it makes sense. So you have to put in the right variables. So it's some kind of nonlinear regression, but it's not quite what you might think in some way. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And that's why I was a bit <laughs> surprised to see these kind of methods used here. And that's why I thought it was interesting to talk about that because often in elections, you have sparse data, you have a lot of knowledge outside of the model and the data that you have to include in the modeling and the model per se. So that definitely is super important. I mean, ideally, all of this should be in the same large model. Yeah to have a generative approach, as you said earlier. Yeah. I'd like to go back to something Andrew said earlier, which is about the importance of undecided voters or swing voters in the fundamentals model and also how much uncertainty is estimated in a given election. And I'm wondering how you can estimate this very share of swing voters before the election happened. Like, how does it work here? Well, I mean, you can estimate swing voters in different ways. Like there are surveys you can ask people if they voted for different parties in different elections. Then you can try to predict people's votes from their demographics and geography. And some groups of people are easier or harder to predict than others. Mm -hmm. But in the economist forecast, and we're not really predicting swing voters, like that's just using the poll averages. We're not really doing anything at the level of the individual voter. Mm -hmm. If you say like our fundamentals based forecast gives lower coefficients for more recent elections because there are fewer swing voters. I can't remember what they did for that. But there are various ways of estimating the general trend of that there are fewer swing voters than there used to be. But we're not doing that at the level of the individual voter. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay, so there isn't something in the model like a parameter that accounts for the share of uh, undecided voters in 2020, right? There might be something like that in the fundamental space forecast. So it would kind of be implicit in the prior. That's probably something there. I can't remember exactly how we do that. Yeah, because to me here, it's like, I don't know how you can have this kind of data consistently. You don't have this kind of data as consistently as you get election polls, like during the elections. That's why it was kind of curious to me. And more generally, actually, I often hear people judging forecasting models through calibration of those models. And so I'm wondering what you guys make of this. Like, is this really the gold standard according to which we should judge uh, model performance? Well, it's certainly the gold conceptual standard. But for elections, we just don't have that many elections, right? So maybe you could say there have been 15 presidential elections in the modern era or something like that. Well, we only just recently constructed our model. So we actually are only going to have one election where the model can be tested. Even if you want to do cross-validation, you would only have 15, which isn't really enough. Mm. So I think the idea... You can make a forecast that fails disastrously, but you can't really be a big success, right? Because mm. if we have some outcomes, like we predict something has less than a 1% chance of happening and it happens, we can talk about that in a bit, but that's sort of a failure of some sort. Yeah. If on the other hand, if you say, hey, we made our forecast and we predicted 49 out of 50 states correctly, that doesn't mean it's a success because first, most of the states you can predict correctly with your eyes closed, but then second, getting the remaining few states correct, it's a matter of luck as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. If we get 49 out of 50 correct and people go around saying that, like, I guess I won't complain. But if you're going to get blamed for bad luck, you can get credit for good luck. But it's kind of asymmetrical. The calibration is this funny thing. You can't really go around saying, hey, we're calibrated. We're great. It doesn't really make sense. It's more that you can say where you're not calibrated. That's the best you can do. It's like a null hypothesis. Yeah, I see what you mean. Then that makes me wonder, and I guess we're getting into the territory of your recent paper about forecast incentives, and I'm going to ask you more specifically about that in a minute, but that makes me wonder then how would you judge the performance of your model? Like, what if a world where you can say that your model was successful, or more precisely, when will you be able to say that you are satisfied with your model's performance? Maybe we're never satisfied, right? So you'd want your model to make as many predictions as possible. That way you can see where it, it can be wrong. <laughs> I mean, one complication this election is there's been a lot of discussion about election interference and vote suppression, mm. even people hacking the election machines. So mm -hmm. like there is that kind of residual uncertainty also. Even if we're directly just measuring public opinion, you'd want to make the forecast at a fine enough scale. You'd want to forecast like all the elections at every level, local elections, enough that you can kind of make more mistakes. Just forecasting the number of electoral votes that a candidate receives, that's really not enough. You're your forecast should have more fine structure possible. So basically what you're saying is that the sample size is really small and so you can't really draw any conclusion in one way or another about whether a model is really good or really bad. You can draw a conclusion that's really bad. It's hard to draw the conclusion that's really good. Yeah, and you would need more data for that. So basically you're advocating for having elections every day. Right, Andrew, if I understood correctly. <laughs> One point being what Andrew was essentially implying was that we are forecasting vote intentions and that there are many factors that can affect how vote intentions, vote intentions are being translated into electoral outcomes. So with Elliot, I published a piece in The Economist today, essentially considering rejection rates for absentee ballots mm -hmm. and how that would change the Democratic and Republican vote share in this election. Mm -hmm. And that's one, one part that is not in this model. I think the largest value was that Democrats will lose one percentage point in Maryland. That is not part of the model, but essentially would skew the outcome of the election in a way that would not be forecasted by our model. Okay. On a second point, I would personally be much more comfortable in the predictions of the model if we had any knowledge about how it would work on data where we knew the parameters themselves. Like if we had a way of testing model performance on simulated data. And that's something that we did not really have the time to assess. Yeah, I see. 
Oh yeah, actually that's a small question I wanted to ask you. How much time did the model take to develop from top to bottom? I mean, we didn't develop it from top to bottom since there was already a version from, was it Philip Kremp, Andrew? Oh, Pierre. Pierre. Yeah, so we did pretty much do it from scratch though because so Pierre Kremp created a, wrote a stand program based on a model from Drew Linzer, who's a political scientist who's kind of actually has, I guess, gone into business over the years. Hmm. And the Pierre's model, I actually linked to it on Slate in 2016 and it had problems. I didn't really ever look at it carefully enough at the time, but it, it had some issues with the correlation between the states. But I guess we used the existence of that model and went from there. Yeah. But we pretty much did it from scratch. And then our model is out there for a while and we had some concerns with it. So we looked and it had some bugs in the code and some conceptual problems. And it still has a lot of moving parts. It's even a relatively simple model like this. Like There's a lot of ways it, it can go wrong. I mean, one example, so I am working on the data generating process, like testing the individual components. One peculiar aspect I found recently was that if the weighted bias of the individual posters for an individual state is not equal to zero, mm -hmm. it can happen that an entire prediction is shifted. And it feels like you can't know those things if you only apply the model on observed data. Mm. Because given how many moving parts there are, as Andrew said, it's like hard to know how they interact in practice. Yeah. But to answer like the original question, I looked up the first email that Andrew sent me about the project. That was on February 10th. Our first Zoom call was on February 11th. <laughs> and I think we then finished the model, quote unquote. I think their deadline was at the end of May and may have finished it like at the beginning of May and then went back to it probably like in the end of June or mid of July. Mm. Yeah, and then we had like comments incoming, particularly like over the last month, I think the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I mean, I personally, to an extent over the summer was questioning the point of open source if nobody actually goes sufficiently deeply into the code to assess whether there are any problems to begin with. Yes, there is a transparency aspect about sharing your data and your code. At the same time, there is a false security in it if nobody actually goes to it and checks whether or not it works. Yeah. If you had run the code two weeks after it was published in the GitHub, you would have found, even if you have just run the code top to bottom, mm -hmm. that it would not have executed cleanly. And you could say that if somebody had checked that as the model has come out, well, they should have probably know, like, let us know. <laughs> Yeah, I completely get what you mean. This is the kind of issues we have to deal with PyMC or with RVs, which are two of the packages I contribute to. I think yeah, there is also a lot of, I don't know what's the term in statistics, but there is a lot of people you don't see. So like, I'm guessing that maybe some people forked the repo, ran the code, but just didn't say anything. I think this a huge majority of people, like they use a the code, but they stay completely silent throw the process. That's a problem, I agree. <laughs> so do you guys follow these kind of comments, especially right now? I mean, I guess you don't touch the model anymore, right? We have not touched the model for a couple months. We touched the model once because we found the bugs. I've sometimes blogged it and people have had comments and somebody looked at our calibration where we refit the model to 2008, 2012, and 2016, mm -hmm. and you can get intervals and compare. And there were a couple of cases where the outcomes for individual states fell outside like the 99.9% .9 interval, mm. which implies that the intervals are too narrow. That's where I could say you can look bad even. So it did suggest our model wasn't quite right. It doesn't fully account for the occasional unusual thing happening within an, an individual state. So we did feel that it needed to be improved. It's just tricky. Like you go into the model to fix one thing, you create another problem. Yeah. So it's a serious effort. And we felt that it wouldn't have a major effect on our forecast. So we thought we would wait. It's nice that we have that publicly out there, that we've already had the discussion. You could say that in some way, like this year is an easy year in terms of predicting the outcome of the election. The polls have been very stable. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking a bit about this. People ask me about the forecast and 
like they say, well, I guess now we have Biden at like 93% chance, but it was like maybe 85% chance before. I was saying, what does it mean to have nine and 10 chance? Well, you can make these statements like 10 elections, one time out of 10. So in 40 years, well, that's since like 1980. So since from 1980 till now, could you have one election that's kind of a surprise? Well, in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected. It wasn't a surprise. He was the favorite by the time election day came, but people thought it was going to be closer than it would be. Like there have been surprising elections. So that's one way of thinking about it. But another way of thinking is that's like historically, but thinking about this election, if Trump were to win now let's again set aside issues of like vote suppression mm. and hacking yeah. and things like that which shouldn't be set aside but set aside for this purpose mm -hmm. then trump would win there'd be three things that would have to happen roughly some combination of three factors so one factor is that the polls would have to be off so biden is at about 54 percent of the two-party vote in the polls and it's a lot of polls and you get a margin of error, but they would all have to be off by a few percentage points. That's number one. The second is there could be a change during the last two weeks of the campaign. Something could happen. Well, there's things like, you know, maybe Biden gets a stroke, maybe Trump gets a stroke. All of a sudden, people like the Republicans more, like all sorts of things are possible. Or there's news that affects people's attitudes. There's not that much evidence that news two weeks before the election can affect people's attitudes much, but it could be a little. So Biden's has 54 percent. So if you had two points from the polls being off by two percentage points and one point because of some big piece of news shifting by one percentage point, then there's voter turnout. It's kind of related to the news thing that the Republicans having somehow more enthusiasm. And finally, there is the Electoral College. So the way the votes are predicted to go in the states, it appears that if each candidate got 50 percent of the vote, that Trump would win because he'd be winning more close states. Yeah. So in some sense, not that all of these things could happen, but a combination of those things would have to happen. And so you can't just say like, there's a 7% chance that's what it is. Like, I'm kind of tired of that. Like, I've done that too. Like I say, well, this is like the probability that you win the basketball game if you're down by this many points. But like there, it's clear, like, to win the basketball game when you're down by a bunch of points, you have to play very well, make some good shots, play very solid defense. The election is a little different because it's not so much up to the candidates at this point. It's not that Trump would win by doing all these amazing things like in a basketball game. It's more like they're not really ahead by 10 points with a minute to go because really there's five minutes to go and really they're only ahead by two points. Like you know, that would be the right analogy. Yeah. So I think people just have to think of it that way. And that's why, for example, there's some people on the internet like Trump supporters who think Trump is definitely going to win. <laughs> And if you think Trump is definitely going to win, you have to think the polls are wrong. But that's OK. You can think the polls are wrong because the polls aren't perfect. But you have to remember that in 2016, Hillary Clinton got more votes than Trump did. And Trump is less popular now than he was in 2016. And Joe Biden is more popular than Hillary Clinton was. So it's not just that the polls would have to be wrong. They'd have to be wrong by more than they're wrong in 2016, mm -hmm. which could be mm. like it's not impossible. But it's worth like thinking through the conditional probability and making that claim, not just that the polls are wrong, but that they're worse off, you know, so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Plus, they would have to be off in the direction of Trump. Yeah, they'd have to be off in the direction of Trump. And people will come up with stories for why that would be. But yeah. also the national polls and the state polls would have to be off, as well as the state polls in states that favor Trump, as well as the states today. It's a tough case to make. But in some sense, our model says that it's not an impossible case to make because that's mm -hmm. where the 7% comes from. No, definitely. This is fascinating. And that's actually a great segue to talking about forecast incentives, which is a paper you co-authored recently, Andrew, with Jessica Holman and Christopher Vladzian. So, and the paper is called Information Incentives and Goals in Election Forecasts. And I link to that in the show notes. But basically, what can you tell us about that? What's the paper saying? 
it's more speculation than anything else. So in the paper, we talk a little about the information that goes into our forecasts and how to convey it. And there's been debates about, like, should you say Biden's at 54 percent of the vote, plus or minus 2 percent? Or should you say this is his probability of winning? People have argued that. I like probability of winning. I like you know, Bayesian statistics. But I do see there is a way that when you talk about the probability, it makes people think about a random process. Like some things like Bing Coins, random process. If I say, if you're about to have a baby and I say the probability that your baby is a girl is 48 and a half percent, that's a random process. Well, if your wife is already pregnant, then like it's already happened, mm -hmm. but we don't know the answer. So that's like the spinner that got spun and we haven't looked at it yet. It's like mm. these famous classroom examples. Mm -hmm. But with the election, it is a different kind of probability. So again, like to say that a candidate has a 90% chance of winning, it, it could be some Somewhat misleading. The idea of incentives is that traditionally it's said that people have an incentive to overstate their certainty. There's a classic experiment like you can do with your friends or you can do in a class, which is you give someone a bunch of questions with uncertain answers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're called almanac questions. <laughs> like you could say, what's the population of Lyon? You know, what year was this thing invented? You know, how tall is this mountain? Yeah. Based on a survey, what percentage of Americans drank Coca-Cola yesterday? Things like that. You give them a bunch of these questions and say, give me your best estimate for each and then give me an interval. Yeah. And the interval is supposed to have a 50% chance of containing the true value. Mm -hmm. So very consistently when you do this, about a third of people's intervals contain the true value. Hmm. In an interaction, you're expected to provide information. Mm -hmm. So people don't want to provide intervals that are too narrow. So there's a lot of evidence that people are overconfident. There's a famous example which was done probably 40 or 50 years ago by one of the psychologists who worked in this field where they went to a conference of civil engineers and they described a certain embankment and they asked the civil engineers to estimate how high the water would have to go. I believe I might be getting the details wrong, but I think it was how high the water has to go before the embankment would fail, would collapse. And each person was asked to give an interval. And I don't even think it was a 50 percent interval. Maybe it was like a 90 percent or maybe they just said give an uncertainty interval. I'm not sure. Seven people gave their estimates and their intervals. And the intervals, many of them didn't overlap. And the true height at which the embankment failed was not in anybody's interval. So there's a lot of literature that people don't like uncertainty and they overstate their certainty. What we said was that in election forecasting, there is actually an incentive to understate your certainty, mm -hmm. to be underconfident, yeah. to make your intervals wider. And this is the point. So our model says that Biden has a 93% chance of winning. What if we were to say, well, it's really only 83%? Well, that's probably safer for us because our interval is a little wider. Like then if we happen to be wrong, we still think there's a 7% chance we'll be wrong. Now, as I said, if we're wrong, there will be a reason for it. I don't think it'll just happen out of the blue. But if we're wrong because the polls are so far off and so forth, then we'll be kind of really embarrassed. But if we had said that Biden's chance of winning was only 80%, we'd be less embarrassed if our forecasts were wrong. Similarly, with intervals, if I supply a bunch of 50% intervals and two thirds of them contain the true value, that's kind of almost okay, because then it looks like a more accurate, like, oh, yeah, most of the states were inside our interval, right? Now, I mean, you can't fool people. If I say the probability of Biden winning is 50%, that's not very helpful, right? So yeah. you have to balance what you're conveying and how people are interpreting it. I guess one way of saying it is that if you think about it as like an economist, there's no reason for anybody to do anything unless they have an incentive. And there's no reason externally that our probabilities should be calibrated because it's not at all clear what the incentives are. If our probability is right or right, whatever that means, if it makes sense, it's because of the internal structure of the model. Hmm. So it comes out of there and our model is not perfect. And so that leads to imperfections in the probability. Mm -hmm. This is a fascinating discussion. And then you talk about all that in the paper. This is really an interesting read. Can you tell us a bit about the Martingale property that you have in the paper? Martingale was the name of a betting system that people had back in the 1800s. And the idea is that if you have a gambling game, you bet one unit. And then if you win, you win one unit. If you lose, you bet two. 
And then if you win that, the second bet, you have one. If you lose the two, you bet four. And if you keep doubling your bet, and then when it's over, you finally won one unit. And that was like a popular betting scheme because people kind of forgot that eventually you can lose all your money. But the Martingale property is something from probability theory. And it says the expectation of an expectation is an expectation. So let's suppose I'm forecasting the election. It's easier to talk about a few months ago. So suppose it's June and I'm forecasting the election in November. Yeah. So and I forecast that Biden has a 80% chance of winning. I could also make a forecast of what my forecast will be. Mm -hmm. So in June, I could forecast what my forecast will be in September. So here I am in June. Let's suppose I say Biden has an 80% chance of winning, according to my model. And then going to forecast in September, I'm going to have a forecast. Well, it won't be 80%. It'll be something different. It might be higher. It might be lower. But your forecast should have the expectation equal to the current value. So it's not appropriate to say my forecast is 80%, but I think it's going to go up to 85%, then I think it's going to go down. It's similar to what people say, like theoretically about the stock market, that you shouldn't be able to predict how it's going to go. So the interesting thing is the polls you can sometimes predict. Like you could say this candidate is going to have a convention, and so I think he's going to do better in the polls. Hmm. And then I think this candidate's going to do worse in the polls. Sometimes you can predict movements in the polls, but you shouldn't be able to predict a movement in the forecast in the same way. So if you have a forecast that starts at 50% and then one candidate has a 90% chance of winning and then they have a 10% chance of winning and then it goes back up to 80 and back down to 20, like if it moves around too much, that's a sign that if there's some problem with the forecasting algorithm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but it can happen, yeah. you know, it can happen with forecasts that overreact that don't correctly incorporate information. Yeah. Like you could create a forecast that will do that, like if you want. Suppose I had a close election and sometimes one candidate's up in the polls, sometimes another candidate's up in the polls. And my forecast is I literally take the most recent poll, take the estimate and then the standard error, fit to a normal distribution and get the posterior probability that the probability of it being greater or less than 50%. And I report that as the candidate's probability of winning. Mm -hmm. now, if I literally do that, then it'll just be jumping around all over the place. It won't satisfy the Martingale property. But there's no reason it should, right? Things like probability distribution satisfy the Martingale property. But to do that, you have to have a joint distribution of your forecast on every day. And our model doesn't satisfy the Martingale property because we don't have a joint distribution of the fundamental space predictors on all the days. <laughs> yeah. Yet another imperfection. Yeah, <laughs> this is great. Maybe last question for you, Merlin, before I ask you the last two traditional questions, which are quick. Like quickly, Merlin, can you tell us some limitations that you have in the model? You already talked a bit about that. And so does the model have such known or suspected limitations in your opinion? Or maybe if you had to work on it today again, how would you improve it? I mean, starting with the last comment we received from the Harvard Data Science Review to which we submitted a description of the model. He essentially said that given all the comments that we made, we should be uncertain about certain parts of the model. He said that our estimate of like Biden's win probability should be between 50 and 60 instead of between 80 and 90, given how uncertain or how problematic parts of the model are. And one of the things is like the correlation matrix that we use for the random walk is essentially built up on some values chosen as essentially the basis of the covariance matrix multiplied by a correlation matrix based upon some social demographic predictors for each of the state's past election outcomes. And then having all values smaller than zero made equal to zero, then I think the matrix was made positive definite and then scaled so that it would conform to what we would believe, how public opinion changes in the idea on the national level. Mm -hmm. Like this is one approach of creating this matrix for the model, but it does not consider our uncertainty in the estimates of the individual parameters in that matrix, mm -hmm. nor is it something very much theoretically motivated way that would consider how states actually move together over the election season. Mm -hmm. And I think to a large extent that applies to many of the other parameters in the model. Whereas mm -hmm. like this is 
a good guess, and this is probably close to the truth. And this gives good outcomes if you put it on past data. But yeah. it's, for many of those particulars, we don't know how they work together and we don't quantify our uncertainty in any of those choices mm -hmm. in a particularly motivated way, I would argue. Mm -hmm. So I guess the first thing that we should probably work on eventually is the covariance mix for the random walk. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. And then next next part would be the, the fundamental space forecast. Oh, that's good. That means it's modeling, you know, like it's a never ending endeavor. <laughs> But that's nice. So that means you can learn at every iteration. And that's what's really yeah. awesome. Okay. Unfortunately, time is flying. So we have to wrap up here. Before letting you go, though, I'm going to ask you the question I ask every guest at the end of the show. So, first one if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? One would probably be climate change. Mm hmm. I mean, given the characteristics of the question, if I had unlimited time and unlimited resources, that would be my main concern. And like loss of biodiversity. You would be in good company and some guests have answered that. I think it's the model response. Andrew, so what would you work on if you had unlimited time and resources? Which problem would you try to solve? Oh, I'm not sure. It's hard to answer that. <laughs> It makes me think of like the problems I do work on and like, are they the right things to be working on? I have more <laughs> time and resources than most people. I, I guess I've made the choice like to focus on methods. So mm -hmm. with most time and resources to develop better methods for statistical modeling and computing, which could then allow people to do all these other things. Yeah. But of course, I do develop these in the context of particular examples. So I actually have done work on climate change, reconstructing yeah. climate from tree rings. It was very hard. And I didn't respond to that by throwing myself more into the tree ring problem. I responded by abstracting things and saying, mm -hmm. well, let's try to work on general Bayesian computation. And maybe that motivated this. Yeah. It's funny because in the world of statistics, I'm an applied person. <laughs> but if you kind of step back in the world of science that we're kind of focused on methods, you know, and I would guess that would be true. Like at least for Merlin, like working on the election forecast, is that the most important thing? Well, the election's important, but is the forecast so important? Well, mm -hmm. maybe not, but it's allowing us to develop our school skills and understand things when outside people are engaged. It kind of holds us to a higher standard and so forth. Yeah. Completely. I would say that those choices are partially based on capability, like what are we best at, and partially are based on like what are we interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, it's based on who knocks on our door. <laughs> it's much easier to collaborate with people who want to. If we had called up Merlin and said, hey, we saw your forecast, we'd like to help because we can do better that he might not have responded, right? And so mm -hmm. you work with people who want to hire you, who want to work with you. It's a tough trade-off. Yeah. My former PhD advisor did a lot of work for cigarette companies hmm. and helping them like with their lawsuits, doing economic analysis. I think at a technical level, his analysis was fine. And I asked him, I said, like, do you really want to be working for cigarette companies? And he kind of gave a bogus answer because he said, well, I know it's not politically correct, but blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I just say, you're only on this earth once. Is this where you want to be spending your time? But I think it has to do with not so much that he cared about cigarette companies and not even so much for the money, although that was part of it. But, you know, they wanted his help. Mm -hmm. So... I do business consulting and I don't try not to do any consulting like for businesses that I think would be doing harm, but often it is like, hey, they want to work with me so we can do stuff and learn things. Mm -hmm. Wow, guys, it went into philosophical territory here. I'm like, I'm super impressed. <laughs> Uh, let's jump to the second question now, which is hard to... So Merlin, maybe let's start with you. If you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? I mean, if we were to remove the scientific mind question, I would probably have an answer. And this will make Andrew uncomfortable. But like, I greatly enjoyed TAing for Andrew because of the things I pick up along the way. Mm -hmm. And like, that's kind of work. Well, it said that the best way to learn a subject is to teach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly. And Andrew, what about you? Do you have like great scientific mind that you would have dinner with? I guess Laplace. Ah, yeah. He's supposed to be not a very nice guy. So I don't know what it would be like, like actually having dinner. He might be kind of too busy or full of himself. But him or Stanislav Ulam, 
Mm. I feel like they would be two people who I would find it maybe easy to talk with. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Clearly agree. And maybe Laplace could have, I think he was friends with uh, Condorcet or something like that. So maybe he could have invited him to. Would have been a very interesting discussion about elections then. I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> okay, guys. Okay, Andrew, Merlin, this was such a pleasure having you there. Thank you so much for taking the time. I could talk about this for hours and I hope your work will be as inspiring for listeners as it will be for my next model of French elections. I hope my questions weren't too nerdy for you. All the Stan and R code for the model is open sourced on GitHub and as usual, I put all the links and resources in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Andrew and Merlin, for taking the time and being on this show. French elections are much more difficult to study because you don't have stable partisanship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's my curse. <laughs> okay, guys, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. This has been another episode of Learning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher and visit learnbasestats.envol.app for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasestats.envol.app. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman, Fit MC Lars, and Megaram. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base. You can change your predictions after taking information. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base. Change calculations after taking fresh data. And those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.